they came in, whoever they are, and bought um, some December call options. And they bought those options for $1.15. Well, the stock over the next several days popped from $49.08, that's when they entered the trade, to $53.44. So if you bought the stock, sure, you made a nice trade. You made, you know, let's call it uh, $4 and uh, a couple cents. That's a nice trade, but you had to commit. If you bought 1,000 shares, Eric, that would have cost you $49,000. Why is that? 1,000 shares times $49. But if you bought these options for $1.15, those options went from $1.15 to over $2.50. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Eric Chemi. Today, we are going to be talking all about options trading. There's so much volatility in the markets right now, especially on the macro side, that sometimes you need options to actually better hedge your risk or to better take advantage of that volatility. So you get a trade portfolio profit that's beyond just the directional move, but you can get a volatility profit as well. And if there's a real downside move against your trade, you can protect yourself. So I'm bringing in the Nigerian brothers. They are my favorite options experts. They have been doing this for so long. John and Pete are, are the true pros at this. They have their own following on, on their channels as well, which we'll get into in a little bit. But quick bio before we get in, because they've done so much in the options space that I really want to get this right. So John Nigerian has 40 years experience in financial markets, including a 25 year career as 25 year career as a floor trader and member of the CBOE, the Chicago Board Options Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, the CME and the CBOT. A lot of acronyms there, a lot of trading. Pete Nigerian, who has been recognized as one of the top 100 traders by Trader Monthly, became a professional options trader after playing several seasons of NFL football with the Minnesota Vikings and Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I think we see that gopher pin on the jacket there. Together, John and Pete serve as co-founders of Market Rebellion, a company they formed shortly after completing the acquisition of their previous company, Trade Monster, by E-Trade in 2016. Founded by the Nigerian brothers, who you see right here, Market Rebellion is on a mission to challenge the status quo of trading and investing by empowering independent investors like yourselves with guided trading services, insights, trading education, content, and tools so that you all can trade with confidence. So John and Pete, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll just start, I'm going to start with John because your screen is bigger on, on my screen right now. He's older. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Much older. <laughs> when you look at the macro environment right now and you're looking through your sort of more micro options data as well, what do you see? Do you see a Fed that's got us on a soft landing path or do you see a real implosion coming up ahead? Great question, Eric, and thank you and Wealthy on for having us on. It's great to be on here. Um, I think the market is still sort of whistling by the graveyard. Um, and the reason I'm using that analogy, Eric, is because the Fed has been extremely transparent. Pete makes this point all the time that uh, Jay Powell has said what they're going to do, which is they're going to keep hitting inflation with higher interest rates until they beat it to death. <laughs> and um, I think they're going to get their wish. I think eventually they're going to have to stop. Uh, they've taken two pauses in a row. Maybe in December we'll see the third pause. We hope so. But if we get any kind of hot reads, Eric, I think that the Fed is likely to continue uh, the, the only medicine they have for higher interest for uh, higher inflation, and that is higher interest rates. The, the, the Fed can do nothing else in terms of that, in terms of bringing people into the markets, they can lower interest rates. Um, and that's what I think they're going to have to do in 2024, because I think, unfortunately, just like that battleship analogy that we use, that it's so difficult to turn that battleship, um, that they're going to have to go too far to beat inflation down far enough, and they still won't get to 2%, but the damage to the economy will start to be larger, and thus they'll have to actually uh, start cutting rates that's what I believe will happen. So the options are really kind of reflecting um, in certain industries that the Fed is likely done or close to done. So at least that's a good thing in my mind, Eric. 
how often do you agree or disagree with your brother? When you heard everything he said there, do you think he knows what he's talking about? Are you guys in a mind <laughs> meld or do you get into fist fights because you can't agree on something? It's very rare to get to the fist fight point, but uh, you know, once in a while we do disagree, but I think generally it, it's, it's something that we're both looking at a lot of the same information. And, and as John said, uh, I've been saying forever, Chair Powell has been as transparent as any we've ever seen, right? And he's telling us exactly the data that they need, exactly where he wants inflation to be, and he's going through this whole process. By the way, 99.8% in December that it's going to be another pause. So, and, and that's not me just saying that, that's actually from the CME Fed tool that they've got. So, it gives you an idea of where we really are. Are we going to have three in a row? I'm going to say that we are. And uh, it's interesting just looking at the different information that we get every week, obviously. And we've started to see a little something helping out the markets, at least to some degree, which has been in crude oil. Uh, we talk about it all the time. We talk about gas and food and everything else. But that's something that we were at 90, 90 plus, not too terribly long ago. And then suddenly we start to drift lower and lower. And now we're bouncing off of the mid 70s into the you know mid upper 70s. So there's a lot of things going on in the backdrop. I think John uh, outlined it very, very well, but um, we don't, we do not disagree very often. We're looking at a lot of the same information. We're looking at volatility. We're looking at the commodities. We're trying to, you know, parse through all of that. And the one thing that I would say is the consumer, the one thing that they don't have is fear. You know, people can say that there's fear out there. And I'd say, well, if they're that fearful, why is credit card debt to the levels that it is in the trillion plus level? So uh, I think that folks are still trying to wrap their arms around whether or not they think we'll be in a recession. And I always like to point this out, Eric, a recession is a whole lot different than a depression. And, and I think a lot of the folks out there that are listening don't always pay attention to that. And I think it's very important. You can go through a recession. Heck, I think a year ago we went through a recession and 90% of the population had no idea. And a lot of folks still don't admit that we did. I'm telling you we did, but that just shows you it can be shallow and it might be shallow this next go around as well. Oh, we got a couple of things to, to talk about here. So we're going to get into that recession thing in a second. Jay Powell, you both said very transparent, maybe one of the most transparent, if not the most Fed governors that we've seen, Fed chairmen that we've seen in our history, does the transparency lead to more volatility in the markets? Because you're you're hearing what he says, you're trading off of it, you're ping-ponging, oh, he said this, he said that, I'm looking, watching all these data points, whereas maybe 30 years ago, I don't know what Greenspan's doing, so I'm going to sit tight, maybe not make a trade. Do you have more of an options opportunity to take advantage of volatility because of the transparency? I think the transparency, to me anyway, Eric, says that uh, uh, that we're going to see less unknowns um, from the Fed. Uh, as long as the market uh, is walking down, you know, whatever they want to call it, the random walk or anything else, um, everybody's kind of okay. But when something comes out of the blue, like, oh, what was that? You know, that's when the market drops. Um, that's when people get spooked. So the fact that uh, the Fed is really sticking to its guns and walking the walk that they said they were going to walk, we're not seeing those big surprises. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, go back 18 months and you see when they moved 50 basis points, 75 basis points, those are moves that are larger than were expected. And that's why you saw more volatility at that time. Since then, they've basically been taking baby steps, little 25 basis point moves when they make a move. And they've been uh, telegraphing that easily and fully. So we're not seeing the same volatility we would have seen against Greenspan, even against Yellen or Bernanke. This guy is much more transparent, and that's why less volatility around his decisions. What about Pete? You said you're, you bet that there was a recession <clears throat> and, and people didn't know it. 90% of people didn't know, it, but you think there was a recession. What data points are you looking at that, that everyone seems to be missing? What are the numbers you're focusing on to give you that perspective? Right. Well, I, I think the interesting part was just about every data point that, that you would point to to say whether or not we were or weren't in a recession, I think pointed to the fact that we were in a recession. So it, it, it just was that much more clear. The one thing I did want to point out, and John was just talking about this, but I'll tell you, Eric, it's been amazing to see what's happened with volatility. 
because it's not too terribly long ago. Volatility was something that was just kind of running away. People were getting a, a little bit more fearful, obviously, going back to March and the regional financial crisis that we had. That was something that spiked volatility for sure. We've had volatilities even not too terribly long ago into the low mid 20s, call it. And, and now look at where we have fallen back to. And that's, I think, a lot to do with what the, the chair and what the Fed has been presenting to us. And we've watched volatility go, call it from 23, back down to the 13s as of today. Now that's going to move around a little bit more. But the amazing thing for me is that I think John and I are in the greatest spot in the world and others as well, when you consider the fact that where is all the volume? A lot of people I hear people say all the time, wow, volume's really kind of drying up. Not in the options world, not in our world where we are. Matter of fact, we have had multiple days throughout November. I think we've had at least five or six days where we've traded over 50 million contracts in a day. And that's pretty incredible. We're averaging close to 46 million contracts per day. When you look at these numbers, there are people that are taking advantage of the opportunities, I think, that, that options can give you. And that doesn't mean it's for everybody. There's a lot of different uh, reasons why I say that, but you better have knowledge because it can be a very difficult area as well. And you have to understand why things are moving the way they are moving. But I can tell you this, where volume is, is where the options world is right now. That's interesting. Because I don't think people realize that. You always see the New York Stock Exchange <laughs> volume in the newspaper on the local news, right? What was the stock volume? You never see options volume. They never talk about that. Let's yeah. let's get into some option strategies or how you look at stuff. I think, John, you might have even had some charts maybe for us to, to just walk us through some examples of how someone can use options to better hedge risk or better take some profits in a way that they can't do just by owning the owning the index or the security outright. Sure. And uh, uh, folks, don't let your eyes glaze over. I'm going to make this as easy and straightforward as possible. Um, the nice thing about options are they are not a perpetual instrument. A stock like Apple is a perpetual instrument. If you buy Apple, you're going to own it until you decide to sell it. Um, if you buy an option, they have what's known as expirations. In other words, you only own it for a limited amount of time. But because of that, you get some great leverage, Eric. Uh, and that's what people that trade options are trying to get. Number one, they can define their risk because, you know, if you buy an option, you can only lose what you paid for it. Uh, and number two, you get this great levered return. So Pete and I became famous uh, for uh, uh, unusual option activity. And here's an example on the screen here. This one's from a financial company, um, AGNC, and it was basically middle of October, beginning to middle of October. Oh, I'll, I'll do a quick timeout. I'll just say, anyone watching this, don't go do these trades now. These, I think, are yeah. trades that are over. Don't. These are examples. Right? Don't look at the ticker. Don't try to go buy an option. This is not a recommendation to go do this now. This is just, here's an example of how they used options in the past to, to get better returns. I just want to mm -hmm. make that clear to anyone watching before they start hitting the trigger button. Yeah. Great advice and well said, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, they bought 20000 of a certain option, a put option, which is the right to sell Who's at a they? price. Who bought the 20,000? Uh, um, we don't know. We okay. never know who it is okay. that buys them. It's anonymous, which is one of the reasons, of course, that people love trading options is that they can sort of stay under the radar. Can I ask so you a dumb somebody, question? Go ahead. But somebody sold 20,000 puts too, right? If there's a buyer, there's a seller. So has How do you know, is this a bearish strategy or is this a bullish strategy? Because there's two sides of that trade. Yep, that's a great question. And the answer is that there is a bid, meaning where people are willing to buy an option or a stock, a midpoint in many cases in between the bid and the offer. So if we see somebody stepping in and paying the offer, meaning that in this case, these puts were perhaps 36 cent bid offered at 38. Somebody comes in very quickly and in one big block says, I want to buy 20,000, I'll pay 38. And all these other guys say, sold, 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 except it's all electronic and silent. You don't hear that anymore. Um, it all just happens in the data center, Eric. So when these guys came in to buy 20,000, that represents 2 million shares short at that nine strike, because again, the time frame is November. 
This happened on October 12th. You see the date on the top of the screen there. Um, then they came in and paid that 38 cents, which was the offer. So to us, anytime somebody's buying something on the offer, that tells us they want a leveraged return. And in this case, they could only lose 38 cents if they were wrong, Eric. 38 cents uh, is all that they could possibly lose. But if you shorted this stock at the same price, at $9.04 and the stock pops to $10 or $10.04, you lose a buck. You don't lose 38 cents. Mm -hmm. In this case, you can only lose what you paid for it. So there that you see that big yellow arrow, that's where they bought them. Stock was $9.04. Over the next two weeks, the stock slid all the way down to $7.50, which means the right to sell it at nine is worth a dollar fifty at that point, but you only paid thirty eight cents for it. So obviously, you have about a four hundred percent return on this particular trade. And like Eric said, don't go out and put it on today, folks. First of all, those November options have expired. They expired the third Friday in November because when an option uh, has a regular expiration, as we call it, uh, that's the third Friday of each month unless that happens to fall on a federal holiday. So, All right, so go back, so go back real fast. So just to be okay. clear, when you say November 9th, you don't mean November 9th, you mean the November options that are the third Friday of November and it's the $9 strike price that yes, we're sir. talking about. But this suggests to me insider trading. This suggests to me somebody knew something and thought they were being clever by buying options. But are you just saying, are you saying we think this probably is insider trading and we're just following their following their lead? Well, um, I know there are a lot of folks out there who follow whatever the politicians do. Yep. There are entire services that are basically formed so that you can do what Nancy Pelosi and Paul Pelosi, her husband, do. And it's not just Democrats. It's not just Republicans. It's anybody that holds office in the United States. Believe it or not, folks, those people trade on the information that they get from committees all the time. Pete and I see it. And every once in a while, it's not a politician. It happens to be an insider. But those people can get taken to jail. The politicians, 99.9% .9 of them are never going to be brought up on charges even though they might know that there's going to be a contract awarded to this defense contractor and they are the actual committee deciding that they're going to do that. Nonetheless, um, if they buy that particular call option, which would be a bet to the upside or a put option, which would be a bet to the downside, maybe they're going to deny a contract uh, to somebody. Or it could be that an insider knows that this biotech firm is about to fail in its phase two, phase three trials of a certain drug. If you knew that, that's tomorrow's newspaper today. You could make money on that trade. But if you do that, you better be a congressperson or you're going to get taken off in cuffs because uh, the SEC doesn't frown, or rather does frown rather severely on people that trade on knowledge that's not public, except for politicians. I see. So you're you're not saying that you should be the person that puts the 20,000 options on, but once the trade happens, that's now public information. Anybody yep. can see that that trade has happened. So now we can all follow the trade. We don't know why they're doing it, but we can follow the fact that this trade now exists on the what do you call it? like the marketplace, the ledger of just the 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 distributed results of everything that got traded that day. And Eric, Correct. I'd even I'd even say this, John. I would say that you know when when folks make a trade like this, it doesn't necessarily mean there's any kind of insider information at all. It could be just a heck of a lot of work, and somebody who's figured out in this particular case, in the short term, there are catalysts out there of some sort that are going to actually press this thing in whatever direction, in this case, the downside. So it's not that every single unusual option that we see is somebody that's an insider or somebody who's got insider information of any kind. A lot of them are just people that are doing their work. They're sitting on a, a desk at any one of the big financial companies that have figured this whole thing out. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, a, a you know, PE firm, could be almost anybody. But the reality is, 
that one of the things, and I wanted to point one other thing out, when you said, well, somebody's on the other side of that trade. You're right when you say that, Eric. That's a, that's very uh, uh, exactly right, actually. But let's remember, they're just making a market. They're immediately going to lay that off somewhere else. So somebody is the other side, yes, because there is a bid and an ask. And those are the guys that you know that stand on the New York Stock Exchange or they're somewhere else, you know, in the ethernet of the world. But it's trading, you know, and, and that's where those things are happening. And then they're going to lay that off almost immediately and try to catch something if they can. They're not going to be holding this forever. I can tell you that when they when the whoever the seller was to this buyer, I guarantee you they went out and probably hedged immediately with stock. So there is a hedging sort of element that comes into play as well. Okay, that's good. So let's let's see our, our next chart, our next example of how this all works. Okay, here was a, a big stock down in Chile that trades on the U.S. exchange. Um, its symbol was SQM. And what were they doing? Well, just like it says there on the 13th of November, they came in, whoever they are, and bought um, some December call options. And they bought those options for $1.15. Well, the stock over the next several days popped from $49.08, that's when they entered the trade, to $53.44. So if you bought the stock, sure, you made a nice trade. You made, you know, let's call it uh, $4 and uh, a couple cents. That's a nice trade, but you had to commit. If you bought 1,000 shares, Eric, that would have cost you $49,000. Why is that? A thousand shares times $49. But if you bought these options for $1.15, those options went from $1.15 to over $2.50. So uh, you made a over 100% return and you didn't have to put up $49,000. The trade-off though is that the option only gives you that time frame from the day it was put on until December, the third Friday in December. And then that has to be something or nothing. Now you can trade out of it, of course, and that's what we did. But when you see something like this, um, these guys, whoever they are, are putting on the trade, like Pete said, maybe it's insider, maybe it's Congress, maybe it's somebody who just did some great homework and said, you know what, if Argentina really does get a, a, a libertarian elected there, maybe it'll be pushing Chile and Peru and some of the other areas of South America towards more of a, a center of the road policy rather than left wing, let's privatize everything or whatever policy. I don't know what the story was. We only know that they bought those calls and that the calls made people a lot of money. What else? Let's see what else is there. All right. Here's another example. This is a uh, Kotai and Macau, this is one of the largest uh, gaming places there. It's called Melco, M-L-C-O. And Melco Resorts, they came in and they bought a bunch of calls that expire this Friday, November 24th, Black Friday. Well, they bought them last week and the stock was $7.27. The stock shot up to $7.76. So again, Congratulations, if you bought uh, the stock, you made about 50 cents. If you bought these options, um, you more than doubled your money. But again, the trade-off is you only had until this Friday to be right. So it almost becomes a binary bet when the time frame is that short, Eric. So Pete and I always say, be careful if you're trading something that only has a few days or a few hours to live because that's almost binary, meaning it's going to be black or white. And you hope, of course, that it makes you money. But if you're the seller, you're hoping that the person you sold it to only has that tiny sliver of time to be right. And that's why they're willing to be a seller. The binary bet you bring up, a lot of this to me looks like it could be considered gambling, right? If people don't know what they're doing, they're winging it. Hey, I think this is going to move 50 cents in a week. I'm just buying these options. What do you say to people who say, hey, this is just gambling. This is not investing in an actual company that that has security. I'm not investing in the, the country like the S&P 500. What do you say to that? I'd say it is a lot like gambling, but 
Um, in Vegas, as as we both know, Eric and Pete and I haven't been at the same table together, folks, in <laughs> Vegas. But um, I'm guessing that if we were counting cards and the casino found out, they'd kick us out, all three of us. If we were acting in concert, they'd kick us out. But you can see this in the stock market and see that, okay, maybe it is a little bit of a gamble that I'm betting that the reason they're buying these options is because they know something, they think something's going to happen. Um, they don't beat us up, they don't kick us out. You can stay at the tables as long as you want in Wall Street, but in Vegas, they kick you out. So I'd say this is a better deal than the betting that you do in Vegas. Well, and I'd, I'd, I'd add to that, Eric, and just say, you know, Sure, there's a difference between investing and trading, but trading doesn't necessarily have to be uh, gambling, right? I mean, you're you're using all of the knowledge that you've gained about a company, whoever that company might be, and you're you're positioning yourself for a trade because of that. And now the risk is really that time frame, like John was talking about. And what are the catalysts that are in front of you? These are all the things that we go through this all the time when we're talking about the options world. We we're looking for well, what's going to be a catalyst? Why would they buy these? What's the thinking probably behind them buying something in the energy space at this point in time? What is that? You know, what are you, what are, we're looking for all those answers. And if we can get some of those answers, at least as many as we can, and we, and we feel pretty comfortable about it. Yeah. Then you're going into a trade because I would view gambling as just saying, Hey, look, you know what? I think today Apple's going up. So I'm doing this. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're going through a whole process of, things that, you know, we eliminate some things and we add other things, but we're looking for reasons why this is a trade to the upside, the downside, could be Tesla, it could be any name that you could think of, could be the entire market, the S&P 500. So there's just a lot of different ways. And maybe that trade would be based upon, hey, this is what the Fed looks like. I just, the, the part that I don't know is what will Powell say afterwards? We feel pretty confident he's going to pause. What does he say afterwards? And that's what, what we try to do and put together. And that's why when we do see options that pop up for us that are pretty significant in size, those are the ones that we follow most. We very rarely trade you know, the smaller trades. We're looking for these big, gigantic trades like we used to see on the trading floor. And so I'm screaming from the other side, I'll buy them. How many do you got? I got 10,000. Done. <laughs> you know, those are the trades that we're looking for is, is something of size, something that matters and something that is a trade, in my opinion. I have so many questions. So this is good. I, I'm going to get into my later question now because you brought it up. <laughs> S&P 500, the Fed, how do you trade the Fed's move? Is there, when you look at the charts right now, or you look at maybe some options activity, whether it's on the S&P or maybe it's on treasuries or, or a major commodity, is there an example trade that you would show to someone and say, hey, this is something that that I look for on a macro point of view from a, a macro kind of trade. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for instance, now we've, as Pete said, we've had two pauses. We've got a 99% chance we're going to get a third pause out of the Fed. You know what they were buying, Eric? They were buying um, the TLT, which is a 20-year bond ETF. But it's right between the 10-year and the 30-year, of course, it's the 20 year and uh, they were buying puts in that because they were betting that the uh, uh, TLT would go down, for instance, if and as bonds go down, yields go up. So they were absolutely spot on that, uh, you know, the big bets that were being placed uh, in that TLT, they bet on the downside of the TLT, which meant, boy, rates are going to go up. As soon as it looked like we were topping out on those rates and that maybe we'd see that first pause, well, that's when all of a sudden they started coming in and doing the opposite trade. They started coming in and buying call options because, again, as the TLT rallies, interest rates are going down. And interest rates have come down from, what, over 5%? For the 10 year, all the way back down to 443 or something like that, 4.43%. Um, the men and women who are making those big bets, because like Pete said, we care about size and we care about them being bought because we know they want a levered return. So it doesn't matter if they're betting on that or many people were betting on, as you said, Eric, the SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF or maybe the IWM, 
or maybe the QQQ. Those would be three different ways to trade an index of stocks rather than trading the interest rate sensitive uh, TLT or whatever it might be. What is your advice on you know, rookie traders, new options traders, they want to get involved. They want to try to juice their returns. I'm sure you get these questions all the time. What are the three basic things that they should know before they put on that first options trade? Hmm. I'll, I'll start it, John, but you, you can disagree or agree or however you feel about it. But um, I think one of the biggest mistakes I see, Eric, out of people, and I've seen it out of guys that are professionals in the field, they all want to trade big right away. They, they want to jump in and just say, you know what, I'm going to trade uh, this just like I traded stocks. I'm going to buy a thousand of these calls instead of buying 10 or 50 or something. And I think part of that is ego, which is another element that I think goes into trading for all of us is you always have to check your ego at the door. That's, that, that's just a must. But I, I think that they oftentimes come in and they trade too big and they get hit right away. If the worst thing that can happen is they get lucky. Because they get lucky once or twice. Now they think they actually know something and they're going to keep doing that. And then that's when the, the losses really start stacking up because, well, I did it the first couple of times. I'll just keep with this whole thing and they stay with it. And that's, I think, a huge mistake. I think they have to have a game plan. You've got to have the education, number one, but you've got to have a game plan, number two. And I think the, those that don't have a game plan, in other words, if I buy an option for 50 cents and tomorrow it's trading at a buck and a quarter. My first reaction is, you know what? I probably need to trim a little bit of this. That's my game plan. I'm gonna, I don't have to sell it, but I can trim it. I can take, if I bought a hundred, I could sell 20. Now all of a sudden I feel pretty good. Maybe I sell 50, you know, whatever the number might be, but you've got to go in with a plan and that plan can't change just because everything went perfect. And now all of a sudden you go, ah, no, I'm sticking with this thing. I'm staying, I'm all in, you know? I mean, it, it's a lot like uh, Goodwill hunting or whatever, <laughs> some of these crazy things where these guys get a little bit out of hand. I think they have to understand volatility as well. Uh, th there is something about every single stock and not everybody always understands that. They think just the market, right? They've always heard John and I talking about the VIX. And every once in a while, other forms of the VIX. But every single stock has their volatility that they have, which is somewhat normal for them and whatever. You need to know when it's not normal, when it, when you're overpaying for something, unless you understand why you're overpaying for it. So I think there's a lot of elements that go into that. And if people are just jumping in, they're not paying attention to the volatility, the implied volatility, as we call it. Uh, those can be problems because even when you're right, you might be wrong. And, th and that's the mo the biggest headache, I think, for somebody that's new into the trading world, particularly with options is, you know, you bought something, the stock moves in the right direction, but that implied volatility was 100 yesterday and today it's 50. Well, that's a big pull down in that value of that option that you're looking at there. And all of a sudden you wonder, well, gosh, the thing's up two bucks. The stock's doing great. Why is this thing not moving? Well, because you pay paid too much for your implied volatility. So there's a lot of different stumbling blocks, I think, for a lot of rookie traders that go out there. Yeah. And if you thought about it, Eric, you'd know as well that when would that uncertainty be highest for a stock? Uh, it would be the highest into earnings. Are they going to beat? Are they going to warn going forward? Or are they going to give positive guidance? Uh, those are things that would cause people to say, you know what? I don't know for sure. I have a strong feeling that they're going to report strong earnings from NVIDIA because AI is in such big demand. But is it going to be enough that it exceeds the street expectation? Um, is it going to be positive guidance like he gave, the CEO gave uh, two quarters ago when he said, you know what? Our visibility all the way out to 2026 is that we can't make enough chips for everybody that wants all these things. Well, that's gonna drive that stock pretty far. Um, and so because of that happening two quarters ago, what happens tonight on those earnings is that people are uncertain, is he gonna be that bullish again? Or is he gonna tamp down expectations so he can step over that hurdle instead of trying to jump over this much higher bar that he set for himself? Because setting that bar really high is something CEOs rarely do. That was like an exception when he said, AI is so outrageous that we're gonna see just an explosive move out of our stock, and you did. It traded up over 500 from like 380. 
So that was a pretty explosive move. Um, anytime you have uncertainty, whether it's phase one, phase two, phase three trials of a drug, maybe a drug that could um, save people's lives like a cancer drug or something like that, um, that is going to be uh, a binary bet. It's going to cause volatilities to go up. It's going to be premiums that have expanded dramatically. Maybe that option should be pricing at $2, but instead it's pricing at 5 Well, that's because of the uncertainty of what's about to happen after the bell when they announce that, hey, our phase two trial isn't working, or let's wave the flag, it's working like crazy, and we're going to save a lot of lives. That stock is going to go through the roof. Look at what it's done with Ozempic. You know, the weight loss, I know it's a diabetes treatment, but people are using it for weight loss. Well, so Novo went through the roof on that. And it's going to keep going up because people are going to want that drug. It's a designer drug that you don't have to go into the gym anymore, I guess, Pete, <laughs> if you have this thing. Eric, yeah, we're it. still going to the gym together, man. We're still going. <laughs> what, what about, are you looking at options on gold or silver, or some of those big commodities or oil? Is there anything that someone could, could take from there? Because you don't have the same kind of unusual activity opportunities like we talked about earlier. Well, yeah, that's a good. That, I think it's a good. Sorry, John. I, I'll just say this. I think it's a really good question. And energy is a space that we know all year has been extremely volatile, right? I mean, not just this year. It's always very, fairly volatile. So it's why they always strip it out. But uh, it's interesting. It's interesting to see uh, how you can trade within that. And I think that what people don't understand is they say, well, but I can't trade crude oil. I'm not going to trade futures. That's not what I'm going to do. There are a lot of different stocks out there, but specifically, obviously, some ETFs where you can at least have a fairly close mirror to what you're seeing out of crude, up or down. And, you know, names like the XLE, I just throw that out there because it's one of the biggest ones, right? And, and you're talking about Exxon and, and Chevron and those kinds of names. And believe it or not, they th those do track pretty closely. Now, the moves are definitely bigger at times than, than what you're seeing out of crude itself, but... There are, there are ways, and that's why you can even use individual names sometimes. So you take a look at, like, for instance, an Exxon and say, well, it kind of tracks pretty close. It's a little bit more volatile. It's a little bit more movement, you know, but, but they do track each other fairly close. So there are ways where you can kind of trade within the crude world without having to go to the futures that might be a little bit more fearful to go with. And now you've got an individual name that you can trade either the stock or the options to be able to do it. Yeah. And Eric, every once in a while, you've got somebody like Warren Buffett, who we all respect, um, one of the greatest investors of all time. What's he been buying all year long? Oxy, O-X-Y, Occidental. That's not just my opinion. Obviously, it's disclosed with anybody that's trading his size. It gets disclosed in their uh, reporting that they have to do by rule. They have to report how much have they bought or how much have they sold. Well, Warren Buffett's been buying Oxy virtually all year. So if we saw unusual option activity on the call side in Oxy, which we have, it's not uncommon to find out that Warren Buffett was a big buyer over the last several weeks. And whoever perhaps the firm is that was executing that trade for him, maybe they were trying to um, not just like Pete said, they don't just sell. Uh, when you come in to buy something, the person you're buying from hedges if they're a trader. If they're a customer, they're probably selling out of what they already own, or they might sell short. But in the case of Warren Buffett coming in, buying 10 million shares at a clip, uh, yeah, that probably triggers a lot of option trading in that stock. Let's let's talk a little bit before we go about, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sick today, but I, I'm not going to reschedule. You're We're doing right this through, today, man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> talk, talk about your football backgrounds, right? Like you guys played sick. You know, a little little cold here is not going to stop, stop, you know, from getting your skull crushed in. Certainly not going to stop anything else. So how does that play into the trading mentality? Because it is a fight, especially when you're on the physical floor and you're elbowing people to get those trades on. Talk about the transition from, from football to options trading. And, and did it help you succeed or does it actually, are you successful in spite of all the brain cells you lost? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a two-sided question. Uh, yes, uh, the, the brain cell loss is absolute. But uh, on top of that, one of the things or three of the things that I think both of us have taken away from our sports careers has been 
And we say it, this word every day, 50,000 times a day, but the word discipline, right? I mean, to grow, to grow into the, the football world, to get to the NFL, how do you get there? Well, you've basically probably been in the gym at five o'clock in the morning while you're in high school or college. You've done all of the different training that you've got to do. You've had people bite your you know, head off about things that, that you did wrong, but they also give you some a little bit of a pat on the back here about the things that you're doing right. All of those things kind of help develop this whole thing that we call discipline because you you know that every day you've got to do that. You've got to eat right. You've got to do that. It's just like the preparation that you get for each trading day. You, you have to be prepared for the day. You've got to know the latest news. You've got to know the catalysts that are moving the markets. You've got to know something about just about everything. It's Eric, it's one of the things that I think John and I always brought to the table when we've done television has been, you know, there are people out there who are an energy trader. You've got other people out there that are tech guys. You've got all these various analysts that are very specific in their field. The great thing about the options world that that really, you know, and it's it's part of football as well is if there's a new somebody every day, <laughs> you know, every week you're playing against a different team. And so John and I, I think because of that, we we gained a lot for the preparation side of things. We're always overly prepared. I mean, we are making sure that we understand the day. And yesterday it was all about, uh, it was all about NVIDIA and Tesla, but today it's a little bit different. It's Best Buy and it's, you know, Abercrombie. And then the next day, you know, you're, you're constantly moving around and it really does. It, it, if you don't, if you're not prepared and you, you better be, but it's just like the NFL, you've got to be prepared every single week. And if you can do that along with having that discipline and the one thing I mentioned earlier, and I'd say it again, you got to put the ego at the door. It's some of the very best players in all of sports, just like some of the greatest traders that John and I both know, their ego stops once they walk onto that trading floor or sit down in front of their computer because you can't go in there with an ego. You can go with confidence. So it's it's kind of very much like a, a Mahomes, right? You see Mahomes, you see him in the interviews, he's smiling, he's laughing, he's great. Tom Brady, the same thing, right? I mean, Tom Brady truly is the GOAT. And you, and you watch him, you, you could hate him, but the guy just was amazing because he had discipline, he was prepared, and it was not about his ego. If he had to do something different than what you know he wanted to do, he he would do that because he was in for the for the win, right? I mean, he was always that guy, continues to be that guy, even post-football. And that's what I think John and I try to work on every day. Yeah, it's discipline, Eric, is the uh, secret ingredient, if you will. And it doesn't matter if it's options or if it's stock or if it's futures or crypto. Um, you've got to have the discipline to take profits when you have them. Like Pete said, you buy an option at 50 cents, goes to a buck 25. What was your plan? Well, I thought maybe I could double my money on this trade. Well, then it, you've done that and then some. Take some off. Take some 50% or 60%, whatever. Take some money off the table. And on the other hand, if it goes from 50 cents down to 25%, 25 cents rather, you need to cut your losses and move on. And again, not get the blinders on and get focused only on the loss. Once you cut that loss, then all of a sudden you can feel a little uh, relief, believe it or not. None of us like to lose, but having the discipline of always cutting your losses and then taking your profits means you'll be at the table a lot longer. Mm -hmm. So good. Guys, this is great. Tell us where can viewers see more of you? It's Market Rebellion. Is it the YouTube channel? Is it a news center? I know you've got some books. I'll sit here for 10 minutes while you explain all the places that they can find you guys. Uh, you're very kind. Um, and uh, we love Wealthion. We love all the great uh, interviews that you guys do with folks like us that are really um, out there putting themselves out. And so thank you, Eric. Um, we have a, a YouTube channel. Um, it's Market Rebellion. And so if you go to YouTube and you typed in Market Rebellion, uh, right next to your Wealthion, subscribe, click subscribe, and you'll see you know, we've done over 4,000 videos. Pete Who are you and I rebelling have. against? <laughs> We're rebelling against doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, we want people to understand that there's nothing wrong with trading stocks, but you should be a rebel and learn about options, even if you don't trade them. You should learn about it. And you're sort of rebelling against the status quo on Wall Street. 
You know, you'd like to think that uh, you could take advantage rather than being taken advantage of. But yeah, Market Rebellion, either .com or Market Rebellion on YouTube are two great ways to follow what we do. I'll let Pete offer his insights as well. Well, we, we've got that book, so I'm going to throw it out there. It, it comes out the 27th, but it's, uh, you know, it's all about options. It, it really is. And and it's not an option because it's not an option to do something different than what you, you know, it, it, you have to do what you need to do. And I think that it's, I just think that it's really important. And by the way, and, and John probably gets tired of me saying this, but I always laugh about this, this one particular thing. So Warren Buffett, we all respect him, right? We think he's one of the greatest. He's the Oracle. He's this, he's that. Warren Buffett is phenomenal, and he calls options weapons of mass destruction. However, he happens to be the largest option trader in the world. So it's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? There's a guy who he understands how options work. He uses them himself, but he but he he throws it out there that you know that's that's the case. They can be a protective tool. They can be something that you use to try to leverage something. Um, and I just think people just have to be educated, though. I think that's the most important part. We it, it starts with that. You have to understand how you navigate the best way. And the only way to do that is to have an understanding. So we've got a great group of guys who do an unbelievable job of educating people into this world. And I'll tell you, as I talked about the, John, what was the volume? Do you remember your options volume when you first started on the CBOE? 400,000 options a day, Pete. And now we're 46 and a half million or whatever it is, <laughs> Eric. I mean, gives you a little bit of an idea. So it is the place to be, and it's what we love about every single day. Is it's it's fun, it's a challenge, but uh, you know, there's just a lot of different ways. And I think market rebellion. We're we're just rebelling against anybody who wants to push a push out and say, "Oh, the options are not for you." That's <laughs> yeah, they are actually. I love it. The rebellion guys. Thank you so much, John and Pete and Jaren. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. A lot of you, you might be watching this and thinking, okay, maybe I need to get some financial help, figure out how to invest in your future, your family's future. If you're already working with somebody that you trust, excellent, stick with them. But if you're not sure you've got the right person, you're not sure you have anybody or you don't trust who you've got, you can consider connecting with us. You can consider scheduling a consultation with a financial advisor at wealthyon.com, no strings attached, just a short form. It only takes a few seconds. It's totally free. There's no commitment to work with these advisors. We provide this as a free public service like you hear from John and Pete. We want you to be educated. We want you to have more power, whether you use it or not. And if you've enjoyed this conversation with me and John and Pete, please show your support. Hit subscribe, like it, forward it, share it, do all those things so that more people can learn and they can get smarter about their finances in the future. Thanks again to my guests and thank you for watching.